Hello there, depending on the time zone, it's good evening, good afternoon, good morning. This is the Gildari Freddy Kisun Show. We're coming to you live. If you have your smartphone on you or you're in front of your smart TV, please go to Guyanese Critic page on YouTube and you will see us right at this minute. We are coming live to you and it's the Gildari Freddy Kisun Show wherever you are, if you are now tuning in. This evening is going to be a walk down memory lane, a long journey from the 70s, but we're going to end up in January 2023. I have with me two friends that shared teenage friendship with me. The three of us knew each other when we were teenagers. So I would think that separately and together we shared 50 years of friendship. Now that's a long, long time. We hung out together in the 70s, early 70s. We limed, we argued, we went to all kinds of symposiums, lectures, attend all kinds of public meetings. And when we reach our mid-20s, we went our separate ways. I went into UG and became active with the WPA. On my immediate left is Leland the camera. He went to Germany, then settled in London, and became one of the founders of the WPA branch of the UK. Then to Leland's left is Gerald Pereira, who is no stranger to this program because he was here already. But although he is the leader of a political party called Organization for the Victory of the People, we have him here this evening because he has a tremendous, tremendous curriculum vitae in Pan-Africanism. So let me formally introduce our two guests. On my left is Leland De Camera co-founder of the WPA UK branch in the 70s. To Leland's left is Gerald Pereira, Pan-Africanist and political activist in Guyana. Um, gentlemen, welcome to the program. Um, Thank you. Thank you very much. I will yeah. ask Gildari to... We are talking about politics from our time in the 70s. We're talking about Pan-Africanism that Gerald was involved in. We're talking about Leland the Camus' experience in the WPA in London. So we're talking about politics from our friendship in the 70s right up to January 2023. And my co-host, Leonard Gildari, um, I made a terrible mistake there. I didn't. Um, Leonard always say thank you to the co-host. I forgot that I just take Leonard for granted that he's, he's here. But welcome and good night to my co-host. Um, he's going to, he's going to, what you say? He's going to be shy when I say this. One of Guyana's leading journalists. Welcome to <laughs> It's like a Leonard stock record there, man. Gildari. Um, <laughs> Leonard, um, I think you have an introduction to our two guests and uh, you're free to ask them anything on politics from the 70s right up to January 2023. Thank you very much there, uh, Freddy, and of course, uh, welcome to our two guests. Um, it is always good, as I, and I consider myself way younger than you are, Freddy, uh, to look back at what transpired in our history, because in so doing, you have an understanding as to where this country has to go, and I'm not saying should go. I say it has to go because I think we hold in the destiny of this country, our people, um, in our hands and with our voices and I think there's a different kind of mindset. This is not maybe 10, 15 years back. Uh, the scenario has changed, uh, the platform has changed and why do I say that? Social media, I've always said that. Social media has changed things dramatically. It played a huge part in the 2020 elections. And if we understand that no politicians could hide 
uh, maybe they could hide 15 years back and sit down in Congress Place and Freedom House and say that, you know, uh, we're going to call a press conference. Everything is available, a phone call away, everything is there. Uh, so we have a different dispensation now, and things cannot be hidden anymore. Things that happened in the 1970s are coming to light. Uh, the CIA uh, records uh, have been revealed. They are being revealed, uh, uh, released. And so we could look at things and be able to assess who did what and whether they are the same disposition that they were in those days. Um, I would want to jump right into it and ask uh, you two gentlemen, it has been, a big argument has always been in recent times, uh, whether our people, our leaders in Guyana, especially on both sides, and especially on the afro guyanese side, whether it has been that afro guyanese are not being given opportunities in Guyana, whether there's a systematic um, uh, uh, campaign to, to stymie them, hence that attempt to have had that apartheid um, forum where the Guyana has apartheid. What is your thoughts on, on apartheid in Guyana? What is your thoughts on whether people, uh, traditionally Indians in Guyana, have been the ones who have been jumped or who has taken the opportunities as against whether, uh, you know, afro Guyanese has traditionally been the ones to enter into the workplace and just want to be employees. What are your thoughts on that, Mr. DeCambo? Well, <coughs> in our early days, we were friends, you know, the group of us, and we were left-wing people. We had a left-wing outlook. And we saw society in class terms, right? We had a class analysis. Um, you had the... Um, the PNC and the PPP, right, um, from the 60s and 70s, and the, the, the politics became polarized, right, it, racial voting, etc. But we always had the socialist outlook, and one of the reasons that I think that, although we were around the PPP quite a lot, we never joined the PPP, right, Frederick or myself, because we saw it as, a, as an Indian party, and we thought that um, you need working class unity, you know, as a social, from a socialist perspective. You need the workers together, okay? So we always saw, saw things in class terms. And this is why when the WPA came on the scene with a kind of multiracial focus, I got very excited. I was in London, and I got involved. So this thing about, um, I mean, we can go back into history, right, to look at how the races evolved, right? Um, the, the, the Indians got into the rice industry early on. The Africans um, got into the professions. This is a kind of historical thing, okay? But from my perspective, I see things in class terms, okay? And I, I prefer to analyze society in those terms, right? So that thing about... Um, one race um, getting preference. I mean, people have said that, right? But I think a lot of it, some of it is propaganda. You know, it's, but it's part of our history how the two races have evolved, how opportunities have presented themselves. So, but, but I, I prefer to see things in class terms. This is my position. Gerald? Uh, Leland made a point earlier. He said that. Uh, a number of us, we would hang around the PPP or so in those days because Michael Ford Bookstore was the only bookstore selling revolutionary and progressive literature at that time. Mm -hmm. If you wanted Sichaba, which was the official organ of Nelson Mandela ANC, the only place you could have picked up a copy of Sichaba was at, free, at Michael Ford. If you wanted World Marxist Review, Books of Lenin, Marx, Kwame Nkrumah neo-colonialism, all progressive literature, you had to go there, posted. So it was normal for us to go there on Saturdays or Friday afternoon to get literature. And you'll have debates, right, with pe members of the PYO, people who were in different organizations and so, but people were reading. Now getting back to the issue Leland mentioned about class, I always adhere to class analysis. 
right? I don't like labels, but, you know, we have to, just like in the natural sciences, how you identify and categorize things, so in the social sciences, I see myself as a revolutionary socialist. I believe that the alternative to the chaos that we are witnessing in this world, this widening gap in social inequality, income inequality, concentration of wealth in fewer and fewer hands, and mass poverty, right? We are facing ecological, environmental catastrophe, right? What we, there is an alternative. Another world is possible. And we are seeing that people are moving. People are voting in center-left or center- or left-wing parties. Good? We have had more than 40 years of neoliberal capitalism, and I would like anybody to show me where this model, what they call the Washington Consensus or what, was implemented, right, and successfully moved people out of poverty. Nowhere. I went to Ghana, and I'm coming back to this issue of apartheid and everything. I went to Ghana in 1989 for the first time. It was during Jerry Rawlings' time. And Jerry Rollins was extremely popular, right? Because he got rid of a very corrupt government. And he was riding on a wing of popularity. And then somewhere along the line, he brought in an economist, with a, somebody who would have a train with a PhD in economics, who had close connection to the American ambassador woman. And it was said they had some relation. I got, but he started to push and push Jerry into accepting what we call the Structural Adjustment Program. In Guyana, we call it the ERP, the Economic Recovery Program. The WP at the time referred to it as the MT Rice Park. Part. <laughs> but if you see what this thing did to Ghana, you had women who had master's degrees standing up at hotels picking, looking for a pickup, right? Because the, the, uh, the, the lending agencies were giving money, giving you loans, and then telling you who you must hire, mm -hmm. right? So that's where the money, so you had all these graduates unemployed. And when you go around Ghana, the mining companies, and they are, they, all you can see is huge craters, good, in the ground. But you don't see it. You see high-rise buildings, you see a, a, a very wealthy elite mm -hmm. living good, right? enjoying the top restaurants and so, but then you go into other areas. You have people in Ghana who produce chocolate. You go and you show them a bar of Cadbury. They've been working in the cocoa industry for 34 years, 35 years, and never tasted a bar of chocolate. Good? So when we come back here to Guyana, before we get into this thing about apartheid, good? Look at Jamaica, which is predominantly African Guyanese. Ah, uh, sorry, uh, African, African Jamaican, Jamaican, sorry, right? And you look at Jamaica, and you see where the wealth of Jamaica, which ethnic group in Jamaica controls the wealth. You don't see African Jamaicans. You don't see them. It is controlled by Syrian, Lebanese, local whites, and foreign capital. That's the reality. So... If you want to look at the Jamaican situation, it's a, you have to have a class analysis. Class is a powerful dynamic, and so is race. Good? And we must able... You cannot... In this country, people, they're, they're politicians who in, they lack a class analysis. They don't have it, and some are not interested in addressing it. Right? So they mobilize their constituencies along the racial line. The fundamental problem in this country is not Indian versus African. The fundamental contradiction in this country is a concentration of wealth in a few hands, right? And the majority are in poverty. I went to areas, I know areas in this country that they have Indians living in real poverty, real poverty. I've seen it. But race, race is used. Race is used as a tool, as a camouflage, right? to hoodwink the masses of people, to get them to vote along ethnic lines. When the real enemy, when the real enemy in this country is foreign capital that is raping this country, nobody addresses it, none of the political parties addresses it, and you have a wealthy capitalist class. You have the Indians who comprise of that class, and you have other members of other ethnic groups, 
you have there are Africans who have wealth, who are, who may be in the professions and so, and they make a lot of money. But I don't understand what you're saying there, sir. You're yeah. saying that we we have to stop foreign capital because we there was a time we weren't getting any. Now we're getting it. Well. No, well, foreign capital we must call as Barnum said. I agree with Barnum said. Barnum said one thing. He said, at the end of the day, we welcome foreign capital. But who are the gatekeepers? But the show is ours, and we got to dictate it. But who are the gatekeepers? You can't bring well, foreign. Well, no, no, no. We'll come to that. We'll come to that. Freddy? Omai, Omai was here. For mm. 10 years, and Omai never declared a profit. So Omai went away. Omai rooted this country, right? And Omai went away and came back. Were they running a charity? Omai is back now. Omai is back, and Omai is going to plunder this country. You have you Australia. Talk about Omai plays here? Omai. The gold mine. The gold yeah. mine. Where are they back? They're back in Guyana. They just discovered some area where they said 23,000 ounces or how many uh, okay. thousand ounces of gold they got. So they're back. Nothing is wrong with having foreign investment. But foreign investment, foreign companies come into this country, right? We need, they need to understand certain things. They have to obey well, the laws of the government. you people to understand that it has to be the gatekeepers here who do that. No, well, we'll come there. The issue is that both the major parties in this country... The People's Progressive Party and the PNCR have subscribed to the new liberal capitalist model that was imposed. I'm using the word imposed because it was imposed by the Americans in this country on Mr. Hoyt. And he ran with it from Mr. Hoyt time right down to now. That is the model we are using, right? Where the government is, is a minimal rule. The government is investing in certain things, but at the end of the day, at the end of the day, is foreign capital calling the shots. And they're contributing money to the parties. They contribute money to the major parties during election time. It, what You tell me was the reason when the press uh, raised the question with Mr. Norton about the R word renegotiate. He ran from it. Right? Because, because the two major parties are neo-colonial entities. They are not committed to transformational politics to transform this country. They are, they're, they're, both of them are competing to manage it, to, and they compete to show who is better at managing the arrangement. Or There's no transformational the politics. Um, interesting. Well, I, 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 left out, um, I left out something that I shouldn't. I said we were friends in the 70s, and we went our separate ways. Leland went to Germany, then London, I went to UG. And Gerald went to Africa and the Middle East. But um, we're back together, and there's still some commonalities in our politics. Um, that's the Gerald Pereira speaking there that we knew from the 70s. Passionate. He hasn't yeah. changed. That's the same way he behaved there. Is the same way when we were, were together. But... Um, I have a separate question for Leland, who sees red when he hears the word WP. And then I have a separate question for Gerald. I will start with Leland. Leland, um, I sense over the years talking to you, there's a bitterness about what the WP has turned out to be. Mm. Yes. Um, <laughs> this is something that I've pondered. Um, I got involved with WPA in 1979, when they were formed as a political party. And I remember the core principles of WPA. If I can outline them, you know, there are a few principles. Multiracial politics, um, anti-dictatorship, pro-democracy, um, opposition unity, because the WPA at that time saw working with the PPP as important. And it was a socialist party. Those four principles. After June 1980, when Rodney was killed, um, there was a campaign for a commission of inquiry into Rodney's death. So that became another central issue for WP. So there were five issues, right? That was 7980. By 2000, in my view, the WP had betrayed all of those. This is my view, right? And this is something I've pondered and I've tried to work out how do you explain this and this is a party that I kind of embraced so for me it's like a personal thing 
you know, how do you explain this? Well, we talk in parties. Eh? So, sorry, mm. uh, in your discussions, when we talk in parties, mm. uh, aren't there players in there? So the people out there who are knowing who we record in history here, mm -hmm. will know who are the players that would have played a part in doing this? Well, the WPA, right, um, forms a political party, launches a political party in 1979. Walter Rodney was a leading figure, okay? Uh, Rupert Rupnarain, um, and Daya, and I used to quiet, uh, uh, right? Joshua, Sami, <laughs> Moses Bagwan. When we were young, there was a group called uh, Ratoon University of Guyana. Mm -hmm. And the Ratoon group became a part of the WPA, Correct. right? Askria was UC Kwayana's group. They became a part of the WPA. Uh, Moses mm -hmm. Bagwan, Movement okay? And then Rupert pressure. Rupin Ryan came from abroad and Walter Rodney. So they were the central players, right? Um, so this, th th this problem I have is to explain this metamorphosis from 1979 to 2000. I'm thinking like a 20-year period, okay? And I have a theory that I want to um, spend some time, you know, I'll, I'll be very brief. I think you see Kwayan is central to explaining this change, okay? Now, we know you see Kwayan, we know New Ascria in the 70s, okay? And he wrote an article in 1973, published in 1973, called Jagannism, Bornemism, and the People of Guyana. Mm -hmm. And in that article, he said that the PPP were committed to East Indian preeminence, is the word he used, 1973. And then he said that um, the African people re responded to this uh, moved by the PPP for Eastern preeminence, and they sought to achieve preeminence through the PNC. So he saw things in racial terms. Okay? Now, I have a big problem with that. It's something that I've just recently, um, you know, in trying to work out what has happened, I've come across this article. Now, in this article, Kwayana ignores class. Right? He sees things in racial terms, ignores class. He ignores the fact that um, in 73, the PNC had started to rig elections. Right? So there was an erosion of democracy from um, the 68. He also ignores, I think very importantly, the fact that you had a Creole middle class in Guyana who didn't want the PPP or Chedi Jagan to be Prime Minister of Independent Guyana, okay? And a lot of the racial violence, and I think the split was connected to that, to that Creole middle class desire to keep the PPP out. Kwayana ignores that. He also ignores the fact that this middle class had foreign allies. They had Americans, the British. We know now the documents have been declassified the role they played, right, in the racial violence, in the split in the national movement, and the racial polarization. Kwayana ignores all of that. Now, in 1979, when WP was formed, Kwayana's position changed dramatically to become a part of the WP. If you look at what he stood for in 73, and look what the WP stood for in 79, there was a transformation. Multiracial politics, he had a race, race analysis. Um, Anti-dictatorship, he ignored the fact P P PNC rigged election. Opposition unity, that article that I mentioned, it showed a kind of antagonism to the PPP. Whereas in 79, the WP were working with the PPP. And the WP also stood for multiracial politics. Right, which I said his analysis was class, not race. So he made a, a, a 180 degree turn, I, in my view, to become a member of the WPA, to subscribe to their mm -hmm. view. And so briefly, I think after Rodney died in 1980, um, coming up to the 1990s, the WPA shifted again and went back to what Kwayana stood for in 73. That's the worst thing. He become, <coughs> right, there was no class, thing in the class now. No class, 
and okay. antagonism mm -hmm. to the PPP. So I think the WPA, this transformation, has a lot to do with Kwayana. I think he and Rupna Rain, after Rodney died, were the two central figures. And they set the, the direction of WPA. So for me, to explain this, this, um, this, this problem with WPA and this transformation, I think Kwayana is central. Uh, right? This is my sure. view. Right, that's the point. Gerald, um, yeah. there is a, there is a, I want to use the right word. I don't want to say scandal. I don't want to say, I'll use a neutral term. Mm -hmm. There's a story going around that has pitted the government against a group called IPADAGI, mm -hmm. International Year, mm -hmm. um, International Decade for African People. When I read, I had a look at your CV. And when we were young and we, we all went our separate ways, you went to Africa. And I look at your CV and you were involved with some internationally respected groups yeah. in Pan-Africanism. Yeah. I, I, I've seen where you were shaking hands with some top Pan-Africanists in the world. Yeah. Why are you not? You would think naturally when a Guyanese chapter was formed of International Decade for African People, you would probably have been the chairman or the president. Mm -hmm. But you were not, you were not in, in Padiji. How could no. you have been overlooked? I think your credential in Pan-Africanism mm -hmm. exceeds anyone I know in a Padiji. Well, before we get to Padiji, you know, Freddie, if you look at the history of Pan-Africanism, there have always been two tendencies. The, you have the revolutionary tendency led by Kwame, Nkrumah, Sekutore, Modi Bokita in Mali, and those such personalities, right? And you had the reactionary Pan-Africanism, the neo-colonial types, the Leopold, Sedar Senghor, despite all this talk about African socialism and negritude. You know, he had briefcase independence. The French still control Senegal and everything. So you had that reactionary group with Hufe Bani and them in uh, Ivory Coast and so. And Secutore made a very important point. He said, any Pan-Africanism without a class analysis is no good for African people. Mm -hmm. We have a reactionary group of Pan-Africanists, some pseudo-Pan-Africanists, right? They only focus on ethnicity, in Guyana, ethnicity. In, yeah, yeah, not only in Guyana. Yeah. We have them in a number of countries. But we talk about Guyana. But we come into Guyana. There's some fake Pan-Africanists. Their Pan-Africanism is anti... They can only see things in terms of either anti-Indian or anti-some other ethnic racial group. Pan-Africanism is not anti-Indian. It's not anti-any racial group. It's not even anti white. It's anti-white supremacy and the anti-imperialism. Because Malcolm X himself said, not all whites will be our enemy in the struggle, and not all blacks will be our brothers and sisters in the struggle. So Malcolm X was saying that this thing, and Malcolm X was saying that we have to understand, we have to go beyond this issue of pigmentation in terms of identifying. Oh, oh, yeah, well, could we, could we, I would like to know, I've known you over 50 yeah. years, and I've known your involvement in Pan-Africanism. You want to know why they're in Why are you not in it, Pan-Africanism? Well, no, yeah. I mean, you're eminently qualified. Yeah. If you read, if you go and you read the OVP website, and you that's, go to see our part, principles, the yes, the, the Organization for the Victory of the People, you will see, that will tell you a lot about what we subscribe to, including an Afrocentric position. But let me tell you this about the Padiji. None of them, none of those organizations have ever invited me. Only one person would invite me at the time to talk, to speak on what happened in Libya, in uh, Mugabe, in Zimbabwe. And that was Jocelyn Long, the Pan-African movement, yeah, pan Africans. yes. A very committed and decent person. The others, they don't invite us. And I think the reason for not inviting me is fundamentally, I, I see two reasons. One, I call a spade a spade. I have never been in political activism for any material gains. I am a revolutionary. I am here, I believe, I want to see, and it's, I'm getting older. 
and I want to see the young people pick up this button and go forward, right? We have a lot of people who are hypocritical. They're not, they're not telling our people the truth. Cabral say, Cabral, Amilcar Cabral, the great Pan-Africanist revolutionary leader of Guinea, Bissau said, right? Claim no victories and tell no lies to the people. Good? I'd rather go out there and we get 100 votes than to lie to the people, indulge in deception, and get 10,000 votes. We are not into that, right? Those people, many of the Pan-African groups in this country, are those who call themselves Pan-Africanists, they collaborate with agencies, individuals, and organizations whose agenda is identical to what African people are fighting for. That I would say that I don't want to go into any other thing because in this country the Please first thing. Please don't for me to get any. No, I won't. Please don't. But I'm saying. Secutore said something. He said, "If the enemy is bothering with you, then you're doing something. If he's not bothering with you, then you're doing nothing." We have people in this country who call themselves some Pan-Africanists and African rights activists. They can jump on a plane and go to the United States. They don't have any problem. Some of them working in Western universities. They have no problem with obtaining a visa or their children having a visa. And there are others who cannot even transit. Who cannot even transit. I worked with Kwame Touré in Africa. Kwame Touré, formerly Stokely Carmichael. I got away from high school a Friday afternoon to go to QC when Carmichael came here. You remember? Yeah, yeah sure. Good. And years after, I would be in a room resting next to Carmichael and we chatting about Guyana and things and all that. And Carmichael developed a rigid class analysis. And when Shelly Jagan won the elections in 92, he gave me a letter. He said, you're going back to Guyana? No? He said, must give Shelly this. He said, but you could read it. And... He was in praise of Chedi, right? His commitment and what Chedi was able to do. He can, was very can, honest. Can, can I interrupt yeah. you? So, uh, hmm. Because I remember, I don't know if you, you, you went to the lecture to UG when um, Carmichael came. And you know, maybe you didn't. I went to that lecture, right? You went to the QC lecture. Rati, Ratun took him to UG. Yeah. And you had him and, on at QC too. And at Ratun organized. That was a very ask, mm. that was a very controversial trip. It was right, and his position was very controversial mm -hmm. because he said mm -hmm. he was Black Power leader, mm -hmm. and he said that Black Power was for Black people, mm -hmm. and that Indian people. I remember mm -hmm. well that UG said mm -hmm. this: Indian people should organize separately, mm -hmm. right? Um, Ratun distanced themselves. Yes. Michael, yeah. right? I remember. Right? Josh Ramsani <laughs> came out to me this day. Yeah. Um, Ascria didn't. Mm -hmm. And this come back to my point about mm -hmm. Kwaya and Ascria. Mm -hmm. They didn't. But interestingly, Walter Rodney had written... But Carmichael shifted from that position years down the line. Okay, I don't, I don't know. But I'm just he saying what he, what he said in Guyana at the he time, did. right? And Walter Rodney wrote about black power mm -hmm. in the Caribbean, mm -hmm. in the Grounds of My Brothers, mm -hmm. okay? And his position was that black power mm. was for African people. Because he was operating in the American context between white Europeans, yes. European American, and <laughs> yeah. Africans. Yes. All right, could yes. we, um, yes. could yes. we shift um, the. Uh, this is a good theoretical mm. historical, but, but uh, I'm sure Gildari, uh, he does, he does so. know you guys the way mm. I do. Mm. So he will have his political mm -hmm. thing. So let's switch well, to Gildari. Thank you very, very much, Freddie. Um, I heard you guys mention Ipadizi, this International Year of Africans. Um, and that was an organization that came out, uh, to my knowledge, under the APNO AFC um, as, a, uh, as, I think, one of the manifestations from the U mm. United Nations. Mm. But I've always been worried as a Guyanese and somebody who, who like to think in a different way and maybe be the um, devil's advocate. We see several organizations, Rutred, ACT, the Indian Arrivals Committee, all of them aligning themselves to political parties. Is this something that we should be worried about? Why can't they have their own identity that could speak on behalf of the people that they're supposed to represent? Uh, we see this epidemic, the head of it is Vincent Alexander and a couple of others, I think, 
the guy that used to be at um, Saru, Retimai, I think, is part mm -hmm. of it, and a couple mm -hmm. of others. And I look at all these players, and I say to myself as a young person, why can't they stand up and just be, have their own identities instead of just aligning themselves? And then you see the new government comes in. And there's a reason that maybe the government could very well argue, and I'm talking about the PPP government, that, look, this organization is not transparent mm -hmm. and it's politically motivated, and that is the whole reason for it. And I, we have no interest in that. Let's form our own things. My question to you, gentlemen, and you can answer separately, mm -hmm. is whether we have a country which has um, independent minds, independent people, who is supposed to be in activism, um, in organizations, NGOs, which are supposed to be really doing the job, and they're not doing it. I'm seeing that. I don't know. Well, this, this society is so racially polarized, right? And they can't think that. People think, people look at things in a very mechanistic manner. If you condemn the PPP, you're seen automatically as a member or supporter of the other party. If you condemn APNU, you're seen as a PPP supporter, right? And you could see why people hold to that position, such position, because you're right. I look at some of the civil society, so-called civil society groups. I'm highly suspicious of them, right? And of course, they have agenda. All organizations have agenda. And there are some people who are pretending that they're opposed to certain things, but they're batting. They're batting for local certain sectors of this society and for foreign interests. Good? You need independent organizations, and that's why we in the OVP, we are fiercely independent, right? We are fiercely independent, and we keep our distance from them. Because many of them, their leadership and their leadership is highly compromised. Many of them, the leadership is highly compromised. The, the so-called civil society organizations, as I said earlier, I don't take many of them seriously. I don't, because I see when it comes to issues in this society, we were talking earlier about what we see as politics. Politics in this society, and of course in all so-called liberal democracies. You, you go out every four or five years and you vote for party, right? But what we are seeing here, and what Machiavelli wrote about, this is statecraft. Politics is about the police, the mass participation of the people. The people must have a say. Mechanisms must be in place so the people can have a say in the decisions that impact their lives. We don't have that. We don't have that. So what you have is people can get on that social media, TikTok, and throw the thing, everything, nothing that is substantial, and just throw things out there, and anybody believe it. Everybody is it. a politician, mm. Mr. DeCambro. Well, in principle, I don't see a problem with um, groups. I mean, I remember when we were young, there was Ascria that stated they were for African cultural renewal. I didn't have a problem with that. You know, we have a society with people with different histories, and I think it's quite legitimate for organizations to represent, you know, at a cultural level. You have African, you have Indian organizations. I don't see a problem. Now, um, if you become aligned to a political party, now that becomes problematic, right? And I think the, there's an issue there. But in principle, I don't see a problem, okay? At a cultural level, you have organized Because we have people with different cultures. You know, and um, you can have organizations that represent people's culture, okay? But then at the political level, people can make their own political choices. Um, I'm going to come Gerald, um, uh, Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah, yeah. because I spin off from that, so mm. thank you, Freddie. I spin off from that is really, could you say that these organizations, or let me come straight to the point mm. here, is the PPP an uh, Indo-Guyanese party? Would you say that? Um, they profess otherwise. <laughs> well, and maybe I could ask the same question for, for mm. the PNC. I mean, if, if you look at the PPP and, and the, the, the ministers, and I, I think they've always tried the PPP to be a, a, a broad base, not to be an Indo Guyanese party. 
When in the 70s, when we were young, the PUP was very ideological. It was an ideological party. And lots of, there were lots of afro guyanese in the PPP for ideological reasons. We knew EMG Wilson very well, right? We knew Clinton Collymore. Um, Rohi was there as a youngster. He's still there, right? So Cyril Belgrade. Yeah, so people were there I, for ideological. So I think this thing, I mean, the PPP had or always had a, a majority Indian support. But at that in that, uh, in that era, it was ideological, and people believed that ideology. You understand? Now, of course, the, uh, the situation has changed. The PP is no longer an ideological party. But I think they've made an effort to broaden their membership. Um, you know, at least in the leadership, if you look at the ministers, I think it's quite multiracial. The support is still predominantly Indian, OK? So when you say indo Guyanese party, you're talking about the support or the leadership, you know, but... Interested, yeah. right? Well, I want to s go over into an area that we haven't touched on the past seven months that this program is on. And I know Gerald Pereira is going to jump first, and he isn't going to stop until this program ends, because we're moving in the direction in which that was his baby in the 70s. But I want to move in that direction because only Donald Ramutar, the former president, has touched on some of these issues when he was a guest here, and Clement Rui. But for the several months these programs have been going on, we haven't gone in that direction. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to ask the question, and then when the first um, guest finish, the second guest will pick up automatically. We've never had an elaboration on foreign policy issues facing this government and foreign policy issues in general. Uh, Mike Pompey, Secretary of State, came here in September 2020. And all of us were curious what? The first time a Secretary of State visited Guyana, what did he want? What, why did he come here? I have my answer for that. I'll give you it. That visit is connected to President Ali's visit to the U.S. recently. I don't believe President Ali was summoned. I mean, opposition, you know, people who don't like the government would say anything. I believe he's invited for a discussion. The Pompeo visit and the Ali trip to Washington has to do with the beginning of a new Cold War. I think the United States seriously, deeply, and cerebrally believe that they're seeing something that they never experienced with Russia, that during the Cold War 45 to 1989, the USSR was always the weaker of the two superpowers. I could tell you when I was in Canada studying for my PhD. I had Russian friends who would tell me the photocopy machines in the USSR, a big superpower, was way, way below what the United States produced, not China. China's photocopy machines, China's cameras that we see seeing here, is more complex and more sophisticated than what the Americans are producing. Gentlemen, it seems to my mind that the United States sees China as a formidable and more dangerous rival than the USSR, 45 to 89. My position is the United States is our friend. The United States is close to us. We should not abandon the West. But this is a poor country. And if Venezuela could build an aquaculture industry for us, if China could start back the railway for us, let us forget about the Cold War and have relationship with countries that Guyana can benefit from. My question to both of you, and I'd like to see both of you answer. What should be Guyana's role in this expanding Cold War between China and the United States? Right. Very good analysis. Yeah, can, Very good. The first um, point is, can we forget about the Cold War? I don't think we can, because 
our experience, we've had a very bitter experience, in my view, um, with Shedi Jago, you know, in the, in the 1970s, and the US um, involvement and intervention in Guyana. And we know the consequences of this. They, 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 they supported the destruction of the democracy, they supported the PNC, and Guyana was ruined. Right? So I don't think we can forget about the Cold War. I think in the back of our minds, that always has to be there. Um, we, we live in this region, and the reality is the United States is, is the power of this region, and we have to thread very carefully. We have a chance now to develop this country. We have oil, we have resources, and I think we have to be very careful. And... Um, I mean, we have a relationship with China. You know, China is doing lots of work here, doing um, lots of projects. And if, if you know, if, if there's a, build, a, a bridge to be built and they um, tender is the best tender, then we should go for that, right? Um, Venezuela thing is a bit more tricky, right? I don't know what Venezuela can offer us, given the state of Venezuela. Okay. But I think we just have to be cautious and remember what happened to us and, and just bear in mind that... America is the power in this region, and we've learned our cost. If you challenge America, what happens? So that's my position. That's an interesting thing. Well, uh, Freddie is right in what, what he said, but I've always looked at this thing I refer to what we call, some people have accepted as geopolitical fatalism, especially after what happened in Grenada, right? That, you know, uh, we gotta live we got to go along with what the Americans want or what the Americans tell us. And there are those who take a different position. I see Prime Minister Ralph Gonzalez is navigating in a very creative and a very, uh, mm -hmm. very independent way in the way he operates. Uh, this country, when President Burnham died and Mr. Hyde took over, I'm coming back to you. I want to show you something. The Libyans, I was in Libya, and they gave me a missive to bring to give it to Hamilton Green. Hamilton Green was prime minister then. I delivered the thing to Hamilton Green. They were, the Libyans were prepared to help Guyana to secure the borders. They were going to give us oil below world market price, right? And they were going to, they wanted to do over the entire Georgetown Hospital, right? They were going to do that first. When Hoyt la, la, last elections and Hami was launching his good and green. I told Hami and I said, what happened about that thing? He told me, he said, Hoyt refused it to go down the line. I said, why? I know why. He said, Hoyt didn't want to antagonize the Americans. Now, that is absolute nonsense. If a country is going to offer you assistance with health care, and because at the time we were having all that power failure and so, right? Help us with, with oil and secure our borders, good? And you turn it down. And you were, what were the Americans giving you? What were the Americans giving you? Well, so and he turned it down. No, but what I'm saying is, on the issue now of China, yes, China's arising, China's very powerful, and China, the things that, are, that the Chinese are producing, but you said something, Freddie, about the photocopy machine, that's true. You see, the Russians, and you know Russian history, studied it. The Russians had this, developed this siege mentality. So at the time when Hitler launched the big operation Barbarossa, right? They, and then Stalin, them start counterattack. They were shocked at the Russian weaponry. They, the, the, Russians may, the Russians might not have produced a good uh, song system or photocopy machine, but the weaponry they were producing were good. The AK-47 is still one of the best weapons in the world. It can go in coal and wood and, and doesn't jam. And American weapons, American troops used in Vietnam, they lost their lives because the weapons were jamming. So you got to be careful. When it came to domestic appliances, they didn't put a lot of en uh, the energy into that. It went into the war industry, perfecting weapons, because they had... Um, the thing, so uh, they had external forces. I mean, you know, after the, at the time of the Russian Revolution, you had how many 19 foreign armies invaded uh, the, the then Soviet um, Union. So the siege mentality and the, the focus on, on the weapon, the, uh, perfecting and making good weaponry. You know, there's, um, there's a column that I think 
most Guyanese should read because we are now being, uh, being projected as an important all country and the geopolitical thing will come in. But there's an important column that was so interesting that was written, I think, last year or, or a year before, in which um, Ron Sanders, who writes this weekly column in Kaicho, Kaicho said that uh, the aid for CARICOM by the United States, the aid for CARICOM in a particular year was just $1 million, one point something for, these, for this whole region. Now, Correct. Uh, if I was to advise, Leland is right, you got to be cautious. He is right too, that you can't refuse a country giving you a healthcare system because they in the US don't get along. The, the problem, I, I think there are many countries, including Guyana, that would tow the American line and say, you, the big boss around here, but give us what we need. We need an internal railway system. We can not even talk to China about it. No, but they wouldn't we do that. They wouldn't, they wouldn't give, give it to you. It. You, we need, you can ask them, but it wouldn't give We you. need three more ferries. We're not going to ask China for it. Give us it. But if you don't give us it, why must we refuse it from Iran? But Freddie, a couple of days but back, China's there was an Indian. There was an Indian official who was telling America, "Don't lecture us." That's I'm, the I'm and bad you, foreign minister. Yo, but hold that on. man that is the most. Was, but hold on. That man is. That Jerry man is, is, is good. Right that man is great. Jerry is on point, and Mr. DeCamera is on point too. But you have to be very careful. As a country, you're always going to ask yourself, how much could you flex the power? Yes, we have oil and those kind of things, but how? what could you say? India has taken a position that, look, don't come lecture us, we're not going to take sides. Mm. But in a country like Guyana, we don't have any big war tanks, or we don't have any war tanks, we don't have any kind of thing. But I do believe that there's an opportunity that we could probably be able to negotiate mm -hmm. and says, look, we could take certain position. If you want to take certain voting um, position on the United Nations or wherever you, you, we are, mm -hmm. this is going to have to come. So I think the whole takeaway from this, this, this kind of discussion is where do we stand as a country and how do we portray ourselves to the rest of the world? Because it cannot be the argument that what we have as a country again and now we weren't this 10 years back mm -hmm. we in a different position or we have oil but it doesn't necessarily mean we can flex our powers like that yeah. what kind of powers do you have so what do you do i think it has to be on the negotiation table yeah. that it has to come we give you something you're going to give us yeah. Yeah, let, let, let me just say something right about, about connecting to this india issue i have a friend in, in london who is pakistani and he's supportive imran khan and he told me that Imran Khan was really overthrown because he went to um, ne negotiate a deal to get cheap oil from Russia, right? And he said, look, they wouldn't do that with India. Now, the reality, if you're a poor country and vulnerable, you can be pushed around, right? This is what I took from that. India is, is much more powerful and a much stronger position. So India can tell you, I say, don't lecture us. We are not in that position, right? I think we're in a kind of no, but, Pakistani but, kind of but, position, but, 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 you know? You've got to be careful with that. Mm. If you look at the history of India, the Indian military, the Indian military has not been of any period in the history during India got its independence, manipulated and controlled by, by uh, the United States. Mm. You look at the history of Pakistan from the days going right back when the Americans and Kissinger and them got rid of uh, Ali Bhutto. They got rid of Ali Bhutto, who was very, very progressive. They got rid of him, and the United States intelligence services worked with the Pakistani military and the Pakistani intelligence agencies. When they had the war, when Russia was in Afghanistan, the Americans, the Pakistani intelligence service and the Saudis they got together and created Al Qaeda. Mm. The, the, the point, but, the point I'm making so is, you, is what, that what I'm saying is yeah. the way. So the the the, the uh, Pakistani intelligence service and military 
have carried out a number of coups and re they removed Prime. So yeah. it's, it was nothing. Yeah. We were but, not shocked when Imran Khan was removed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. but we haven't seen that in India. Yeah, but and v there's a reason for that. Vis-a-vis -vis India, right? Yeah. Pakistan is in a weak position. There's a point I'm making, mm -hmm. the basic point. Mm -hmm. And I think we, we're, at this present time, in a mm -hmm. weak position also. You know, you're going to be very careful. I think it's too early in the game for us to make any moves that's going to upset anyone. But the definitely allies. American American hegemony is declining. No one can deny that. You only have to see where the world is heading. And American domination is declining. No, because it is always going to be the economic thing. When I think our government was there recently, they opened, I think we signed an agreement for a line of credit, I think was it $2 billion or $3 billion. Mm -hmm. But you look at what has happened in China. China has also been doing that for a couple of years now with, mm -hmm. I think, the road and brick and brick and roads kind of thing. So at the end of the day, I think we have like about five minutes more. Fred mm -hmm. Kisun, I don't well, know. Um, the operator hasn't indicated to me as yet. Right, right, right. Mm -hmm. So you go right ahead, Freddy. I think you you. I'm waiting for him to tell me how much more time we have. Okay. So so we can continue. Mm -hmm. We have five minutes more, so okay. you can go ahead. Right. Um, Freddy started off uh, with the uh, with the WP and so on, and my last question would be, I couldn't understand if it is that the argument that the WP has been losing. It's, it's grounds, maybe supporters and so over the years. What was the strategic importance of, I, I understand that you want to, to maybe fill in the blanks and maybe make up numbers. I couldn't understand David Green's position and Kamal Ramsan's position to uh, bring on uh, WPA on in 2015 as part of the umbrella. Um, I'm going to ask you a question now and maybe in closing. What, going forward in 20. 25. Do you believe that uh, there is going to be any collation at all because w AFC, WPA, and the rest of them, what's going to happen to these small parties? I know we have some new ones, mm -hmm. but the old ones like the WPA, and then we could also talk about the uh, AFC. Bear in mind, we have maybe a few minutes. Yeah. So you mean um, a coalition with the opposition? I'm talking about the future of the, the old parties like the WPA. Um, I think uh, uh, a couple of them, you know them at the top of the head. Yeah. I mean, as far as I'm concerned, WPA is completely, totally discredited, right? I think they're just names. Like in 2015, the, 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 they came on board because Rupert Rupert Ryan was an Indian. You know, I, I think that that was part of Make it. Make up numbers? What, what, no, what kind of numbers? No, it's, it's, it's just kind of when the dressing, you can call it. Okay. Yeah? Because he's someone who has a kind of history, of some kind of credibility among certain groups, right? Um, they've been totally, utterly discredited. So, the, the, and, and, and the AFC. So I, I don't know um, what they can bring to the table, right? What WP mm -hmm. can bring to the table. I think the, the, in terms of the PPP, the PPP seems to be in a strong position. I don't think they need, I mean, they wouldn't, I don't think they, they'll want to, you know, soil themselves by associating with WP or the AFC, you know. So, um, so in terms of coalition, I, I don't know, but, but they're so discredited, those two parties, that, I mean, it's for the, um, the PNC to decide if they want to associate with them. John? Yeah. Um, in the early days, I had, uh, in high school, I joined the uh, African Society for Cultural Relations with Independence. Uh, we got to be quickly, Ascrio, Mike, Right, and you see used to come down. And when they broke, when Ascrio and the PNC broke, we left, and a number of us, and we stayed at the PNC. When the WPA came into existence, you had some people who left the YSM and so on went to the WPA. I always saw the, what, the politics of the WPA, and you brought this out sometime, as basically a petty bourgeois middle class formation, right, that, that never really grounded with the masses, right? And they, they, they were carried away believing um, that... that yeah, well, quickly, my operator yeah, said yeah, yeah. to me. That uh, they had this thing that they could remove Burnham, that the people were there for them and they could re remove Burnham. And when Rodney died, that was it. Uh, Everything evaporated. Le Le um, Leonard? Well, very quickly, um, as a, I would say...
far younger than these guys, and which is a good thing. <laughs> um, it is always good to have the kind of conversation which only not only teaches you a little bit of history and different perspectives, but it also, I think, uh, puts us in a mindset not to want to walk those paths again in our country which wants to move forward. And I, I would want to play a role in whatever little advocacy ways that I can. I know that you are, Freddie, um, gone in that direction, true. but um, I would want to say that the conversation is very good and these are the kind of things that we uh, want. Thank you for watching. If I want to close on a light note, if you are, um, if you are looking at this, I want to close on a, on a light note. The name De Cambra is Portuguese. The name Pereira is Portuguese. And you would not believe it, but we have two Portuguese men in the studio this evening. <laughs> Leland de Camus' father was pure, unadulterated European. Gerald Pereira's father, father was pure, unadulterated European. He was Portuguese and African. Um, you see yeah. the man, you would think he's a white yeah. man. Yeah. You see Mr. Leland's father, you would think he's a white man. But it's good that both of them have joined with the non-white Guyanese population to liberate Guyana. We'll have our guest on Monday. We'll have our guest on Wednesday, as usual. This was an enjoyable program. I'd like to thank the evergreen journalist, um, Leonard Gildari, and my two friends from the 70s for being here. Wherever you are, I have to say good night or good day or simply au revoir of reader saying bye-bye. Thank you very much. Thank you.